You got any solid ones, the kind that don't fly? Sure. And you want to swap for my wreck? Maybe I can make it fly. And you'll let me take my pit? That's what I said. And I'll take you up on it? It's a deal. All right, let's shake. Now the deal's a deal. Oh, and they called me nuts. Come on, let's see your plane. Okay. By the way, what's your name? Mine's Greg. Bill? Bill, huh? You're not gonna Welsh, are you? <laughs> no, Bill. I'm not gonna Welsh. <laughs> Come on in, Bill. Which one do you want to swap for? Gosh, I don't know. Well, there's a whole afternoon to make up your mind. Can I look them over? I want you to. Go ahead. Uh, did you make all these yourself? Most of them. when Broadway looked before even your daddy was born, when horse cars were still new. And there's the old Horton house. And the waterfront as it used to be. You don't know that city, Bill, because it was only a beginning. A beginning for men who knew what they wanted and were willing to work and fight for it. For men who believed that next year it would be different. And when you see the city today, it's so easy to take for granted that it must always have been this way, new and clean and bright. But who can really say what goes into the building of a city, beyond even courage and determination? Perhaps in the case of ours, its location may be important. On the shores of the Pacific, with 22 miles of landlocked harbor. Perhaps tradition played her part. For the first mission in California, the mission San Diego de Alcala still watches over the new city as she did the old. And surely beauty and civic pride must count for their share. But there must be more that goes into the building of a city than lovely parks more than the brick and mortar of its buildings. After all, in 1910, there was a population of only 17,000. And in 1941, almost 225,000. Surely there must also be even more to the answer than business with its stores, offices, and banks. Perhaps the true answer of what makes a city lies in the people themselves, the folks at work and at home. They came to San Diego. They chose it because it has what they want. It's new yet old with tradition. It has business opportunities and still retains beauty. And then there's the climate. The people here have been kidded at the way they brag about the climate, and maybe they deserve it. But the truth is that because of its climate, its strategic position and the natural harbor, San Diego is one of the outstanding naval operating bases in the United States. The investment involved for servicing our men of war is secret, but it runs into the hundreds of millions. The Marine Base is the headquarters for all Marine Corps activities on the West Coast and is the recruit depot for the men, and I do mean men, of the United States Marines. Nearby also are the hangars of the Army Reserve, for in this district are based every type of fighting craft for defense and for offense. The flyers of this unit are of the same ruggedness, the same unassuming strength that makes American pilots and their equipment feared and respected wherever the course of their duty may take them. And as you look down at the city, as it's seen by the men who fly, you can see its streets, the office buildings and homes, its parks, all those things of steel and stone and wood, all the symbols of its growth, all that is, except one, the spirit of its people. But the story of San Diego and its people is really not much different than the story of hundreds of other cities, towns, and villages. It's a part of the American tradition. But there's one American tradition, Bill, of which San Diego's more than just a part. Aviation. But a number of hours of actual flying, there's more activity around here than anywhere in the country. A lot of good that's done me. What I can't get is why I put in so much time on that thing. 
Well, let's get on with the trading. Some people always laugh at very old things and very new things. No. Neither do I. There's a lot of history wrapped up in old time ships. History and courage. Take that drawing there, for instance. John Montgomery built and flew that glider right here in San Diego in 1883, about 17 years before the Wright brothers started on their first glider. Charles Walsh designed and put together the first airplane ever built on the Pacific Coast, way back in 1909. All San Diego helped and cheered him on that job. And then in 1910, aviation got a real boost from a real man. Teddy Roosevelt climbed aboard a plane in St. Louis. When this old motor sputters and roars, it will carry more than a president. It will in some measure carry the future of aviation. Because after the short hop, Teddy makes America air-minded when he steps out of the plane and says his famous, delighted. People all across the country flock to see the new machines in action and watch old-time daredevils like Lincoln Beachy race and stunt at air meets and county fairs. Those were the days of strange-looking planes. Planes built out of wood, paper, and heaven knows what. They'd sputter and go bang like a nickel bunch of firecrackers on a string. Funny? Yes but they flew. Don't ask me how, but they did. And men with more courage and faith and knowledge flew in them. They took a dream by Jules Verne and made it fly across fields. They built a shadowy outline of a bird and it flew across water. These were the planes and these were the men who made modern aviation possible. This is the model of Glenn Curtis' seaplane, which he launched and flew successfully here in 1911. It is the first of its kind to fly. But think of it in terms of modern seaplanes, for the great importance of these early flights lies in their effect upon our lives today. The United States Navy was first to launch a plane from a battleship, only a short takeoff run, shorter than any attempted before, but successful, as our Navy has always been successful. In 1918, the Army Air Corps inaugurated the first airmail service in the world. This flight was under the supervision of Major Reuben Fleet, President Wilson is on hand to wish him luck and deposits the number one airmail letter in the mail sack. Quickly, the bags are loaded into the cockpit. Today, the contents of these bags are invaluable stamp collector's items. The first regular airmail delivery ever made. But as the years pass, better planes and better engines bring closer the day of long distance flights. To test their endurance, the first mid-air refueling is attempted in the sky over San Diego. This feat may seem simple today, but consider the planes and the fact that one slip, one error in judgment would mean disaster. And those of you who have flown across the continent with breakfast on one coast and dinner on the other, don't forget this ship, the first to make a transcontinental non-stop flight. It was in 1923 that Lieutenants McCready and Kelly only after months of preparation and planning are ready to take off. And as the heavily laden ship starts its long journey, there is no coincidence in the choice of its goal. For since 1911, because of its ideal flying conditions, or what flyers call smooth air, the Bay Area has been a favorite experimental ground for the Army and Navy Air Forces, as well as for civilians. This same Rockwell Field, where the first non-stop flight will end, has also seen the first loop-the-loop the first radio in a plane, the first aerial photos, the first official parachute jump, the first night flying, the first aerial bombing. All in all, this has been the two world records in aviation. And the safe landing of this plane marks the end of an era. That was the past. And this is the present, at least one part of the present, the civilian side. These planes are all privately owned and flown. But the people of San Diego have been quick to follow in the footsteps of the pioneers of aviation. And today, 24 private airports in the county stand as landmarks to the vision of its people and their determination that next year it would be different. These civilian pilots aren't thrill seekers. Your neighbors and mine are learning to fly now. 
Here, a mechanic, a clerk, a housewife, a secretary, a truck driver, and a banker are taking their preliminary ground training, studying the construction of a plane and what makes it tick. And what they are doing, anyone can do. Because it's not hard to learn to fly, and it isn't long until a student pilot is soloing and making practice flights. Here is a landing as good as an experienced pilot can make. And then the all-important question that they all ask, how am I doing? Okay, says the instructor, take it again. And the story of one civilian airport is the story of all 24. All kinds of people, all kinds of ships, large or small, doesn't matter, just as long as they fly safely. In front of almost any hangar, you will find luxurious cabin jobs, or, well, planes a little less luxurious. How six foot six can fold himself in and out of that cockpit is something for the designers of upper berths to study. And just as these civilian pilots show their wings, so do the pilots of another type of aircraft. Gliders, planes without engines, flight without power. Gliders or sailplanes are built for soaring. They're designed in such a way that once they're in the air, they will be able to sustain flight by taking advantage of normal air currents. These planes are launched by a rope or cable attached to a coupling device in the nose. As the ship gains speed, the pilot takes it up higher and higher to the full length of the tow line. Then he releases the coupler and his craft is airborne. The field at Torrey Pines is considered the finest spot for gliding in the whole country. Near here it was that John Montgomery flew his glider away back in 1883. And here it is that the youth of today follow in his footsteps. For many years, gliding was looked upon merely as an exhilarating sport. But recent history has driven home the fact that it is an exact science. And not only a military science, but the study of air currents carried on right here has resulted in findings which have had a vital bearing on every type of aircraft. And when it's time for some to return to the field, the landings are made smoothly and evenly. And while these ships come in, others stay aloft to test their wings and skill in a friendly contest with another kind of pilot. time being, Bill, all those civilian pilots have had to give up their flying because of the war. But they don't mind. They're too busy. Too busy building the tools so that others can fly higher and further. You know, your hometown has always been one of the most important centers of aircraft production. For instance, the Solar Aircraft Company has specialized in the manufacture of exhaust manifolds. Their early pioneering with the cooperation of the United States Navy is in a large measure responsible for the mass production and high performance of manifolds which are used in the planes of practically every aircraft company in the country. In the plaster pattern shops, the forms for various parts are laid out and molded. The building of parts which will fit into airplanes often assembled thousands of miles away calls for work of the highest precision. Much of the assembly work is done by a welding process, especially developed for the heat and corrosion resistant steel, which Sola was the first to use. The final product is checked and inspected before shipment to any one of the more than 50 aircraft companies who use exhaust manifolds built by Solar. Among the pioneers of San Diego's largest industry are the Ryan Aeronautical Company and the Ryan School of Aeronautics. They have designed and built one of the world's most unusual airplanes, the remarkable YO-51. It is a short-range liaison and observation plane and is called the Dragonfly. An intricate system of slots and flaps give it the ability to climb almost vertically and hover in the air almost without movement. Yet when speed is required, it can step out at a fast clip. The Dragonfly is establishing new standards for the control of aircraft at extremely low speeds. And when it comes in for a landing, it can come to a stop almost the instant that the wheels touch the ground. And on the factory floor, men and equipment are working at top speed. Mass production machines turn out the thousands of parts 
which are later put together on the assembly line. And the same machines which fabricate parts for the Dragonfly also turn out the parts for another plane, the ST-3, a low-wing monoplane for the training of flying cadets. ST-3s have an all-metal fuselage and are the first monoplanes to be used for primary training. Formerly, all planes for that purpose were biplanes, and the changeover to monoplanes is of major significance because practically all combat aircraft are of monoplane design. And when the wings are mated with the fuselage on the final assembly line, the plane is practically complete. The propeller is attached to the streamlined nose. A few final installations are made and another trainer is wheeled from the assembly line to take its part in the training of new pilots for our fighting planes. And Ryan not only builds the planes, but also trains the men to fly them. For the Army, under its expansion program, has selected the School of Aeronautics as one of the foremost commercial schools to give primary training to the flying cadets. Ground school and classroom work is as important to a flying cadet's training as the actual flying. Experienced instructors take them in hand to explain how a plane is built and what goes into it. Before these men can earn their wings, they must learn mechanics, navigation, gunnery, and many other subjects. This classroom and ground school work is what helps to give American pilots the finest training in the world. The cadet's working day is divided between the classroom and flying instruction. It doesn't take a genius to guess which they like better. For flight training, the cadets are assigned to small groups, with each group in charge of an individual pilot. And in this way, every student receives what amounts to private instruction. Before each flight, the instructor gives precise and detailed orders as to what maneuvers are to be executed when in the air. At first, these maneuvers are quite simple, and special stress is placed on fundamentals. Takeoffs and landings are practiced until the cadet is letter perfect. And as a cadet tries his wings for the first time, his training is just beginning. He spends 10 weeks at the primary training school, but then there follow weeks of basic training, advanced training, and a thorough break-in period of active service. And at the end of 10 weeks of primary training, this is the way they fly, smoothly and in formation. These men are ready to go onward, yes, and upward. The graduation from primary school is carried out with military formality. Overhead, an instructor salutes the class in his own way. The cadets who have successfully completed their first training period line up beside the group of new cadets who have just arrived at the school. This scene is being duplicated by thousands of cadets at flying schools all over the country because this year, under the Army expansion program, more than 30,000 new pilots will be trained to take their places beside the veterans of the United States Army Air Corps. And now, in a symbolic gesture, the captain of the graduating class hands over his sword to the captain of the newcomers. Fathers and mothers proudly watch their sons line up for the last time at this field. These boys are on their way. They're going places, and the sky's the limit. Above the hangar of the United States Coast Guard base at San Diego is the motto, Semper Paratus, always prepared. America's first line of defense against storm and disaster, the Coast Guard's courage and endless service is a constant blessing to the fishermen who go down to the sea. Typical of that service is an incident that happened just a short while ago. Days out from San Diego, off the Mexican coast, the captain of a fishing boat sends out an urgent call for help. Below decks in the tiny cabin, a seaman is tossing in the agony of acute appendicitis. The captain's message is urgent, but he knows that watchful ears are listening. The Coast Guard operator gets the appeal for help. He knows what to do, he's had so many before. And into the mouthpiece of the loudspeaker system go the familiar words, get out the hull boat, get out the hull boat. And that ship is always ready to go at a moment's notice. There is no lost time or waste motion. The difference of a few moments may be too important. With perfect teamwork based on long experience, the men speed the flying boat down the ramp and into the water of the harbor. The powerful engines roar into action. The ship skims across the waves and is on its way. In a few
few hours, the plane spans the miles it took the fishing boat days to cover. And as the fishermen aboard the ship sight the plane, they carry the sick man on deck according to instructions radioed to them from the base. The pilot lands as close to the boat as safety will allow, and then the transfer of the man on the stretcher is made. In a few minutes, he's stowed safely aboard, and the plane speeds on its way to port. Although operating at top speed, the plane lands smoothly, almost gently, in the harbor. For the pilot knows that a sudden jar or jolt may prove fatal to his passenger. As soon as it has taxied to the landing ramp, the ground crew beaches the ship. This is when training and constant preparation pay off large dividends. For although this is all routine for the crew, they know that it's not routine for the sick man. It's surprising sometimes how men can train themselves to work so quickly and yet so very gently. And in this same way, unassuming, efficient, many another man owes his life to the swift, unfailing action of the Coast Guard. And that's only part of the story, Bill. You know that during wartime, all the Coast Guardsmen and all the Coast Guard equipment become part of the United States Navy. I think maybe I'll join the Coast Guard when I grow up, if my ma lets me. Well, not a bad idea. A lot of their new planes are the same type the Navy uses. Consolidated PBY? Mm-hmm. How'd you like to swap it for your flying wing? Well, I like it best of all, but... Gosh, I don't know. I just don't know. I'd think twice, though, before turning this one down. PBYs mean something pretty special in San Diego. As a matter of fact, they mean something pretty special all over the world. We call them PBYs. The English call them Catalinas. But by whatever name you call them, they're the unfailing eyes that guard the long coastlines of democracy. One just like these spotted the Bismarck and stood guard over her till the fleet sent her to the bottom. The story of this plane and of even mightier planes the story of how they were conceived and built is part of the story of San Diego. It's the story of men who could look in only one direction, ahead. Men whose ideal is an unswerving determination that next year it will be different. On the buildings of the Consolidated Aircraft Corporation is the slogan, nothing short of right is right. Every one of the thousands of workmen knows what that slogan means. So do I and so do you. But these workmen carry it with them on their jobs, whatever that job might be. The men on this hydraulic press, for instance, realize the importance of their work, realize that the only way to do it is the right way. Every strip of metal is carefully adjusted on the forms, so that when the rollers carry the tray to the machine and the press comes down with its tons of pressure, every part will be perfect. The men on the punch presses know that if the quantity or quality of their work runs below specification, that production might be delayed. They see to it that it is not delayed. And drop hammer operators are not individual workmen controlling individual machines on individual projects. They know that they are a part of a coordinated whole, a part together with the craftsman who runs a planer in the shop. And the operator of this machine is a part with the operators of a multiple punch which endlessly punches out thousands of holes for the rivets which hold the airplanes together. Working right with them are the men at the giant shears. These men cut metal with the mechanical scissors with even greater skill than a master tailor cuts his cloth. And though for reasons we all know, you see but one machine and a few workers, multiply them in your minds by the many thousands. Multiply the intricacy of this small electrical installation until you have a mile of wire for each plane. Yes, multiply the skill of this one craftsman by the thousands working together for the sole purpose of building airplanes. This is the shell of a PBY fuselage in the early stages of assembly. Look at it closely as the overhead monorail carries it along the assembly line because here is the same fuselage on the way out. Don't try to count the other ships that are being built. It won't mean anything because they're being built faster every day. Just think that inside of this 65-foot hull, there are eight separate compartments. Included in these eight compartments are sleeping quarters, because the crew of these ships will have some long-distance flying ahead of them. Sometimes the flow of production exceeds even the vast capacity of the assembly hangars. And then, because the mild climate permits, 
engines and wings are assembled out of doors and from this stage of construction it's only a short while until the finished p b y is ready for flight and is in its element the air so steady is this ship so reliable that it can operate on only one of its engines should the need arise with a wingspan of 100 feet these planes have a range of approximately 4,000 miles. In the Navy designation, PBY, the PB stands for Patrol Bomber, whose job it is to guard the coastlines, to do convoy duty together with the fleet, and keep the sea lanes open. The Y is the Navy designation of the manufacturer. This is one of the many Catalinas built for Britain, with the British camouflage and markings. And every day, more of these planes are being delivered, not only to our own Navy, but also to all our allies on every fighting front. In actual combat, many of these ships have been in the air 20 hours out of every 24. Whereas the original PBYs were all seaplanes, many of the new ones are amphibian. They can take off or land wherever beasts can walk or fish can swim. The nose more than ever now resembles a shark and certain fishermen will get to know it very well and very soon. During flight, if the pilot should want to come down on land, he merely lowers the tricycle gear. And if he wants to land on water, the gear is retracted and the wingtip floats are lowered. After a landing on the water, the pilot lowers the wheels and the ship comes up the ramp under its own power. Not only does this make the ship more flexible, but it releases a beaching crew and tractor for other work. There are many things that can be said about these ships, but one fact perhaps can tell the story better than many statistics. Should the need arise, every PBY in commission can be concentrated at any one naval base in 48 hours notice. These then are the PBYs. Patrol bombers. And back at the factory, equally well-known land bombers are being assembled. These are the B-24s, and they have marked Consolidated's re-entry into the land plane field. The original B-24 was designed and built for the Army in less than a year, a record for a plane of this size. The demand is for long-range heavy bombers. These sleek four-engine jobs are the type of ships we mean. Yes, these are the planes we want, and these are the planes we're getting. Our allies call them Liberators, and for good reason. In every Liberator, or B-24, there are more than 40,000 parts, over half a million rivets. And in addition to the home plant at San Diego, these bombers are being produced at a number of other plants across the country. As you look at the assembly line, you may at first see only aluminum plates, rivets, engines. But if you look more closely, perhaps you will be able to see your savings bonds and savings stamps, which make these planes possible. Each newly completed ship is towed from the hangar. Yet with the four propellers quiet, it seems almost strangely incomplete. Incomplete until under its own power, it taxis to the head of the runway and wheels gracefully about for its test flight. Large, low, efficient, deadly. battle dress now, the B-24 soars through the clouds. She is probably the fastest heavy bomber in the world, and with a cruising range of over 3,000 miles, has flown across the Atlantic to England in 400 minutes. As to performance, we'll let that speak for itself, because the B-24 can operate on only two of its four engines, and carrying a full load can not only maintain flight, but actually gain altitude.
But back at the consolidated plant, the doors of another hangar swing open for yet another plane, the PB-2Y. This is an airplane. The hull is 30 feet high and 80 feet long, and the wing spread is 120 feet. The wheels attached to the bottom are only for launching and beaching, and are released as soon as the ship is in the water. Slowly but easily, in spite of its great size, the ship moves down the ramp. And, meanwhile, further along on the same ramp, another PB-2Y rolls down to the waters of the harbor. The four engines just idle while the plane glides along and circles to the head of the runway. The big ship is surprisingly graceful and handles easily, for some people, that is. But now the power of more than 4,000 horses bites into the air. The plane picks up speed and there she goes. speed well over 250 miles an hour and have a cruising range of more than 5,000 miles. And these boats don't need made-to-order flying conditions either. Here's one of them simulating an emergency landing and takeoff on a choppy sea. This is very important because in addition to their duties as patrol and long-range bombers, their size enables them to pick up and rescue the entire crew of a sinking vessel should the need arise. ships, it's hard to realize that only a comparatively few years ago, Major T.C. McCauley celebrated a Thanksgiving day by flying his 60 horsepower plane the almost unheard of distance of 50 miles. See that man at the window near the top of the fuselage? He's six feet of Navy pilot and not a midget. Our coastline stretches for many miles, but no coastline lies beyond the range of the PB-2 Ys and no enemy lies beyond the reach of their striking power. PBY, B-24, PB-2Y, the long right arm of United States offense. And as long as these mighty ships ride the airways, nothing short of right shall be right. So that's what men who say next year it'll be different can do. tips a little more angle, maybe she won't know it's over. And I think I'll give the wing a little more dihedral. Good idea. Hey, um, how about handing me a little sandpaper? 